Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of the Crunchy Take Podcast. And this week, I have the privilege, the honor and ultimate privilege to speak of having on Kurt Fowler. Kurt is an adjunct professor (laughs) over at Indiana State University, and he also subs for the Indiana Symphony Orchestra. Kurt, how's it going, my man? How's it going? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, I, it's, I have no idea how we even ended up in the same building on Christmas Eve. So maybe we should give, we should probably give context (laughs) as to how we met and how like this, this whole session even was planned out to begin with. So we both kind of wound up on Luke's, um, Luke being our worship pastor, my worship pastor, he kind of uh, reached out to you probably to play for the Christmas Eve service, right? Correct. Yeah, because I I have gone to the church uh, a good number of times. Mm-hmm. So we um, and so I get I get to the set and it's just like we we do our thing. I notice, whoa, this isn't the normal kind of worship gig. There's there's a there are actual strings players here. This is so exciting. There's a double bass person <laughs> right in front of me, right in front of the drum kit. And I look over to my left, two celloists. I look over to my right, two violinists. Right in front of me is a double bassist. And to the left of him, her, is another strings player. Um, so I got to ask, like, how, how often do you get asked to do uh, little concerts or events like this, uh, even without COVID, considering? Oh, all the time, all the time. In fact, that night, uh, Christmas Eve, I had uh, I was part of four different church services. Mm-hmm. So I had the I had the two there at the Castleton Church. Um, I then had um, I played. My wife is uh, an organist, and mm-hmm. so I performed at her church for the the late Christmas Eve service. And then I was also I had earlier in the week recorded. Wow. Uh, a piece for another church for their Christmas Eve service, which was uh, had been taped previously, and then I had also earlier in the week um, recorded for uh, a church in Terre Haute. So, so oh. there were you know, at least four or five different things going on just that week, which was great because you know it has not been that way uh, for no, no, many no. months now. Did you anticipate so, it being that way? I know, I know, like what, especially when. <clears throat> the holiday season comes around, this probably is a regular, regular thing, thing for you, right? For most people, they hear this and they go, wow, like you're recording here, you're doing this and that. It's all kind of as a seasoned musician as yourself, it's probably not that uncommon, but this whole year, uh, did you anticipate that at all for Christmas? Uh, I no. after this year, I didn't anticipate doing much at all. So I was surprised uh, when I got, you know, when mm-hmm. Luke had contacted me because he contacted me pretty early in the in the fall semester. Um, so I was I was surprised uh, because you know still a lot of churches are not um, meeting in person. In fact, my wife's church uh, still they're not meeting having yeah. people in the services. Um, so yeah, so I was surprised, uh, but very happy that uh, that things uh, that a couple of things had worked out. That was great. So that very day, uh, was the um, was the thing you had with us? Was that the only live performance that you did? You mentioned that you recorded a you know kind of a Christmas right. special for other churches, right? So that was the only kind of live setting that you played in for today, right? Oh well, no, actually, my wife's church was also live. Oh, okay. However, okay. there there was no congregation. It was oh. a live uh, it was a live broadcast video. Broadcast. Oh, okay. So it was a broadcast. What the? I was about to go into that a little bit like you so throughout the day you went from different different sets of different and obviously early in the week you went from a you obviously recorded as well how social distancing and as a recording artist or musician how has that changed has that changed the process for you at all uh, throughout or is it kind of business as usual because you're separated by a pane of glass anyway you know in, in a studio correct Right. Yeah. And um, for, for instance, for the church service that I played later that night, um, you know, we were all spread out. I mean, the difference is, of course, are that you're playing with a mask, which feels really weird. At least yeah. I'm not a wind player, thank goodness, because um, my wind colleagues really have a hard time mm. knowing how to handle things. And, um, and then, of course, the chairs are more spread out, which does have its downsides because you're used to hearing things 
a little bit more intimately and when you're spread out it's it's a little harder uh, so for instance there at the castleton church you know actually the setup at the castleton church was the same as it as it has been in the past because i've played the last couple of uh, mm -hmm. christmas eve services there and uh and because of the way the stage is set up and because of the way things have to be i mean i'm i feel like i'm a mile away from the violinists on the other side of the the room so it's a little bit hard to feel like you're really connected in that way right can you think of a time but, in your life sorry sorry um go ahead no go ahead yeah. i go ahead. going off of that can you can you think of a time in your life where it's ever been like that for you where distance especially you as a celloist or you in you know in your career lifetime of playing with different symphonies has the distance ever been a big factor like as this has has anything ever come remotely close to this as a you know musical whole whole experience just playing with people absolutely not no i mean this is this is the weirdest thing ever mm -hmm. <laughs> um and, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, so I'm in my 50s, and uh, I mean, you know, I don't know a single person, even my parents who are almost 90 at this point have never experienced anything like this, mm. uh, where you just have to, you have to be distant from, from your colleagues, uh, which feels weird, you know, it just feels, it feels really bizarre, you know, as a, you know, I've done a lot of performing with string quartets, mm -hmm. and generally as a string quartet, you're trying to, like, position yourself so you're as pretty as much as close as you can be to each other and still have you know all the bowing room that you need um and that's because you really have to be able to pick up on little nuanced gestures mm -hmm. and uh, it's harder to do that when you're masked and you're farther apart it's not that it's impossible it's just it's not nearly as as intimate as it, as it usually is right you mentioned your the arrangement of a quartet. Can you kind of run us through that a little bit? Like, what does that typically look like? Because across, maybe across different symphonies, they or different orchestras, they do different things. So, like a quartet, is it usually kind of this mm. curve thing that I'm used to seeing? Is it kind of a flat line or kind of the you know kind of the four square arrangement? What what do you guys normally go with? Like, what's what is the typical that comes to mind for you? Basically, it's like a U, and, okay. and an orchestra is set up really pretty much in the same way. Mm -hmm. A string section is always set up. So it's kind of in a U. If you think of an orchestra, you always have the conductor in the middle. Then the, the string section is kind of in a U around that. And a string quartet is set up basically in the same way, mm -hmm. uh, where you have, and you're always, you know, as, a, as you're setting up for a string quartet, you're always thinking about the audience because you want the audience to be able to see all four individuals. Yet, at the same time, all four individuals have to be able to visually communicate with one another. Um, mm -hmm. So you can't possibly be in a line because then you can't be visually communicating with the person all the way down at the end of the line. Gotcha. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of box-like, but we try to spread it out just a little bit so that the audience can definitely see everybody. You know, because that's part of the performance is the whole mm -hmm. visual aspect. And you want the audience to be able to see everybody. Right. Um, and the configuration can change a little bit, not a lot. I mean, in a quartet, um, sometimes the cellist is on the outside closest to the per, uh, audience, and sometimes the violist and the cellist switch, so the violist is on the outside. The same thing happens with an orchestra. Some conductors like the cello section to be on the outside, some conductors like them to be on the inside. So it just totally depends on, uh, on the conductor and their preference. Mm -hmm. I asked the line questions because you probably like take me back honestly to the first performance you guys did or you did personally uh, past the COVID era, like within the COVID era, that first, do you remember? Cause across many different occupations, myself included, and you know, a journalist that I interviewed earlier uh, last year, like had the same kind of, you know, it, it affects different occupations differently. And for everyone, it, they had just this brief moment of pause where no activity happened. How quick was the turnaround for you? And then what was it like to finally um, get back into the swing of things? Like what it must have been odd, but exciting at the same time, I, I'd imagine. So you're talking about that that point in March where things just went yeah. completely silent yeah. for a while. Do you remember right? what yeah, the um, last thing you were doing before COVID, before yeah, that point in yeah. March was? Absolutely. So, um, 
Well, a couple things come to mind. I mean, first of all, that week I I did happen to be playing with the Indianapolis Symphony that week. Gotcha. Uh, that everything just shut down, and so we were all rehearsing this huge piece for orchestra uh, by Mahler. It's uh, Mahler's Fifth Symphony, mm-hmm. and um, and we had and uh, let's see, it was on a Thursday. Um, and so the guest soloist had come in for their piece. And so we were just about to, to rehearse with the guest soloist. And then the CEO of the symphony came out um, at the end of uh, the afternoon rehearsal, because there are two rehearsals, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, mm-hmm. and, and said, things are not looking good. And he said, we're going to have to you know, make a call as to whether or not we can go ahead with this concert and what's going to happen after this. Uh, and, you know, of course, everybody's just silent. And, you know, we had kind of thought maybe there was the possibility of something happening. Um, but it just seemed so quick and right. so definitive. And so that was the last rehearsal. And then by the, that evening, they had decided that they were going to cancel the concert. Wow. So, so the guest soloist who had just flown in, just oh. gotten there that day, uh, uh, you know, wasn't able to perform and the conductor was also a guest conductor and he had come from i think it was germany Mm -hmm. i I can't remember he was uh, from uh from europe uh i'm pretty sure he was from germany but um at any rate it just seemed so surreal Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's just it was just gone and um it just didn't it it hadn't seemed that much of a reality up to that point Uh, Mm -hmm. i mean i knew things were getting bad we had heard about it happening in uh in europe and it just seemed so weird. So yeah, so that's exactly what I was thinking. And then I knew that the the following, actually, um, that later that week, I was supposed to have a string quartet concert at Indiana State, um, and so that got canceled as well. Mm-hmm. So we had, you know, we had literally been working all year mm-hmm. for that concert, and uh, we almost made it to the concert, and uh, oh. we lost it by about like four days. Oh man. So, so with your occupation though, it's not like the music went anywhere. For for you guys, it it's I I would imagine no, I'm not saying it's the sole purpose of your occupation, but a lot of it is performance based. Right? So the fact that you had built up mm. you spent all this time rehearsing, you spent all this all the logistical time getting to the rehearsal to begin with, and to have all that taken away from you, what were some of the emotions that were going through your head at the time because for different like i said for different occupations it means different things the fact that you guys have this music yeah. and you can't share it what 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 were some of the initial kind of reactions maybe amongst you and your peers well i mean i think everybody was devastated of course you know because mm-hmm. well we're in a very different kind of uh situation than the full-time people at the Indianapolis Symphony. So right. those are the folks who, are, who have really struggled this mm-hmm. year uh, because their entire livelihood is wrapped up in performing. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, there are plenty of uh, popular performers uh, who are in the same boat. I mean, th- they make a living by recording and by performing. And so when that is completely cut out from under you, it's uh, it's devastating in an economic sense, but of course it's also, as you indicated, um, very difficult emotionally because I mean the reason that we're in the business in the first place is not to make money because it's not it's not <laughs> like uh, we're making you know millions of dollars playing uh, in orchestra, but it is our livelihood, and uh, and so that's important yet at the same point the reason that we're in it is because we love music and we Mm -hmm. want to share that with people um and to be completely silenced in that way for a year uh is really uh yeah it's very difficult um and something that i would never have ever dreamed of never would have imagined i don't think uh, anybody did this this. the warning signs were there as far as early as maybe november uh, or even earlier in November, you know, October, earlier in the in 2019, it's, it feels like an eternity ago. You know, at the beginning of 2000, right. uh, the beginning of 2020, I had just gotten done. I just went to a concert with my friends, you know, in close vicinity with a ton of people, standing uh-huh. room, and it's just, um, and you know, 
I feel like going out culture has changed. And I, I, I remember for me, the, the kind of stages that people were realizing this was bigger than it actually was in, as far as COVID was for me, you know, I was working at a, at, yeah. you know, as a facilities assistant at the time and, you know, services were still happening. And so mm-hmm. we, I kind of caught wind of the news and it was kind of, you know, the, you know, at our place, we had, you know, group texts and like a weekly meetings to say, hey, should we be worrying about this? Should we at least be wearing masks? And they were like, oh, no, it's, huh? it's probably right. we'll, we'll just tell people to wash their hands. We'll just tell people, you know, as a lot of pay places were reacting at the time, a lot of workplaces, organizations and um, companies were probably reacting accordingly. So would, would you guys, um, especially in how physical uh, your occupation is, how what were the role? What was uh, the initial kind of rollout as far as a plan and as to as to counter the virus? Like, did you guys. Was it an immediate, hey, don't shake hands with each other, don't, like, um, don't edit, maybe tune instruments, don't, you know, put down the piano key or whatnot, don't you know, touch each other's instruments or whatever? I think, honestly, as I said, I think to me it happened so suddenly. I didn't right. really feel that there was much of a, a, a step process to <laughs> it. Um, I mean, I do remember having a conversation with... Um, some of the the folks in this symphony when we were playing that week. Uh, in fact, I had lunch with the, uh, a couple of the wind players, and and they had been talking about the fact that they, um, they had requested that the the stage people definitely clean the mm-hmm. stage in between rehearsals and things like that. So there was a little bit of that going on. The whole idea of pl- ma- wearing masks uh, was just, I mean, not even talked about at that point. Um, and then at uh, Indiana State, you know, kind of similarly, it just took a little while for things to kick in. And, uh, and as state mandates started coming down uh, of, uh, you know, social distancing, wearing masks and stuff like that, uh, then the university kicked in and, and we all had to kind of go along with, with that as well. So, uh, you know, initially to me, there wasn't much of a process. But once it hit, then things really moved very quickly. And there wasn't much you could do about it, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. you just have to you have to go with it. So, yeah. Did that change the way um, you practiced at all? Did that change your? I, I'd imagine it had a drastic, it had a drastic effect on everyone's life in a in a pretty tangible way. But for you guys, your your music is your lifeline. You know, that's yeah. your that is as you said, it is how it is why you have chosen this occupation. Did it affect the way you? chose to play the instrument at all like times that you would play did it practice like your practice routine knowing that certain material wasn't going to be used like how how did how did you go about just kind of navigating that minefield well i think uh, a lot of musicians navigated navigated it in a different way Um, for me what it really meant was that all of my performing was canceled you know i mean it has been since march except Mm -hmm. for christmas eve um so for me, what it meant was that I had to shift my focus to something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I, uh, you know, I mentioned before that I'm in a very different situation than my friends and colleagues in the Indianapolis Symphony because my full-time job is teaching at right. Indiana State. And so um, let me ask, answer your question directly first. I mean, the, the main thing it did was because it took away all the performing, it really just cut out my practicing because I, I, you know, I didn't have anything to be practicing for in the first place. Um, Not that we only practice for that purpose, but it's an important instigator. Mm -hmm. Um, But secondly, as I said, I had to shift my focus because all of my classes then all of a sudden went online. And so then I had to navigate oh my gosh, how am I going to, how am I going to put all of my lectures together in a meaningful way for my classes? And, uh, and so that's when I had to like start diving into, um, you know, video programs that I had not used before, you know, figuring out, uh, you know, effective teaching mechanisms. Um, And so I spent all of my time Mm -hmm. in spring focused on that, you know, just trying to be an effective teacher. Mm-hmm. Did you, did you? Oh yeah. Sorry. Did you have no, any? Um, so, 
you're lecturing. Let, let's let's kind of segue into you into what you do at ISU. You uh, so you do teach there. What 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 are some of the classes that you teach there? And like how um, it, it, you said you that is your full time job. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I'm actually a full professor there. I've okay. been there uh, for uh, like 22, 23 years now. Mm -hmm. um, so I teach a variety of classes there. I mean, I, I teach cello. That's that's my primary thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we also we don't have a huge string program there. We have a nice, uh, moderate sized uh, string program. So I have a handful of cello students. So you know, generally in the ballpark of like four or five, six uh, cello students uh, a year. So I'm teaching them, but I also teach a music appreciation course, um, which is generally online. I usually teach an online uh, music appreciation course. Um, I teach the history of rock and roll, which is fun. Uh, I have a great wow. time teaching that. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it is fun. It's, uh, that's been a lot of fun. That's pretty much my favorite class to teach. And then I also teach a music technology course. So uh, in that course, I teach uh, a music notation program called Finale, uh, you know, which uh, music majors need to learn uh, to use. I also teach a web development section of that class. And then I, we do a little section on digital audio workstations. Uh, so we try to integrate a variety of different things in that class. Um, then uh, the other class that I teach is a string techniques class. And so for music majors who are not string players, uh, who want to be music educators, uh, they have to take a class in all of the different you know, instrument families. And so I teach the string family. Okay. Uh, so you know, all the wind players or percussion uh, percussionists, um, who are in music education, uh, they take the string tech class. And so they all get to take a semester of how to play a stringed instrument. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so it's a, there are a variety of things uh, to do uh, at the university. So thankfully you weren't, so what you're saying is you're, you definitely weren't bored when, when COVID, no. when COVID first started out, <laughs> this wasn't a situation kind of like a lot of, a lot of the population that just yeah, had their jobs taken from them. You had a job to do and you didn't exactly know how you were going to do a lot of these different tasks. Right. 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 Yeah. You seem very well versed in exactly so many right, forms of different music, man. That's awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I grew up listening to rock and roll, so, mm -hmm. um, uh, as and as a performer, I feel like I can kind of integrate both of those elements into my history of rock class. And plus, I also have always enjoyed history mm -hmm. in general. So you know, it's kind of a fun, uh, fun class to to get to teach. Uh, but I also I enjoy the music appreciation course as well because classical music history is also just as as interesting. Um, okay. But. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I enjoy the variety of things that I get to do uh, there at ISU. And, uh, and actually, this semester, I did a lot more uh, in the technology realm because we, we decided we needed to start um, video broadcasting our performances mm -hmm. and so forth. So I've been kind of the point person for doing that. And that's totally new to me. Um, Isn't that so, fun? But though? it's been fun to learn. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, I mean, th there's so much to learn and, um, and so many different ways of going about things um, that has been fun. But as you said, I have not been bored in the least uh, <laughs> yeah. because there's always been something to do. It just hasn't been the same focus that I had before. I mean, before COVID, I mean, my year, you, I mean, you, you should see my calendar. I mean, it's just incredible. There's so many different things that I'm juggling between teaching my classes, teaching, you know, my cello students and and all of the performing and rehearsing that has to happen mm -hmm. on a weekly basis for a variety of different things. And so for um, the change was incredibly ab abrupt mm -hmm. in many ways, uh, as much as I miss it, there's also been kind of a... Um, a settling feeling about right. it because I, you know, I'm just constantly running from thing to thing. So run out of my class, go to rehearsal. From rehearsal, I go teach a cello student. Then I may have to like run downtown to an uh, Indianapolis Symphony rehearsal, and it's just like you're constant, constantly moving and constantly flowing. Whereas all of a sudden in March, I was sitting here in my closet, uh, which is where all my tech stuff is. 
and uh and that's pretty much where i was mm -hmm. i wasn't running from thing to thing um and uh and there was a certain amount of peace about that um that i had really? not expected yeah i mean just because it's like oh wow i mean i can i can settle <laughs> i can settle and focus on one thing in my life for like the first time ever um and so it, it that was that's been an interesting feeling yeah that's interesting that you say that because you know i i listen to many different podcasts myself and one of them being the most popular podcast in the world the joe rogan experience and he sort of talks about he him as a comedian and he would said in his you know in his whole career of being a comedian this was the first time in about 20 years 25 plus years that he didn't be able to just not travel not do anything ah. and just stay at home for you. I, 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 I'm what I'm picking up is that it's sort of the same thing. Uh, Absolutely. Which we have the complete opposite problem because I'm just, <laughs> I'm still trying to start my career, but whereas you, you've been going I, at this grind for so long. What was that a relief to you in some ways just to be able to say, you know what? Oh, I can just, Hey, I can practice whatever I want to practice for a little bit. If I don't, if I don't have this commitment of constantly going, like you said, downtown to Hilbert circle, and just like doing uh -huh. these different things like was it in a sense a relief to you and what came out of that period of time that wasn't there before uh, if if anything did for you yeah i mean definitely it was a relief and I mean, it's hard to say that relief is the right word because it that right, makes right, it yeah. that makes seem it. like you didn't want to be doing it but mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time as I said, I mean, it was like the first time where I could just like sit down and breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, after so many years of just running from thing to thing, uh, it, it kind of builds up. And, uh, and I had never realized how intense that was. So, yeah. So in many ways, I would say it has been a relief. And, and I've enjoyed being able to focus my attention a little bit more. Yeah. Um, to the point that, you know, it's uh, as I think about, okay, what happens when we get out of this? Because, you know, we're still in the midst of it. Yes. Um, my teaching has, has, you know, we were back in person teaching at ISU this past fall, and we will continue to be here in the spring. But it's a different kind of teaching um, because it's partially online, it's partially in person, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's a real mishmash, and it's, and it's, and it's been a difficult year for that reason. Um, it's just, there's a lot to try to juggle in that regard. But then I wonder, okay, so what happens when the symphony starts going again, when we start being able to perform again? Um, will I jump back the same level that I was before? Or will I just try to tone things down a little bit? I don't know, it's very hard. Right. As a performer, sometimes you're, you're in a... Um, kind of in a tough balancing act because uh, you know for instance when the indianapolis symphony uh calls me and asks me to play um i always jump at the chance because i love playing with that group they're a really fantastic group of performers uh it's a really high level of playing and uh, and so for me it's incredibly gratifying to play with them um the hard part is that when they call me I, I also have my classes and my other teaching to do, and I have to figure out, okay, how do I play this week of services, still man maintain the classes and the teaching that I have to do? And so that's always a struggle. Um, but as a performer, you know, because I, I, I am not a regular member of the symphony, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I would start saying, no, I can't play this, no, I can't play that, the more you stay, say no, they're not less likely you, they're yeah. going to ask you, right? You know, so it's this tough balance act between, okay, how do I make my life sane right. and yet still maintain this important relationship uh, and with this group that I love to perform with? Mm. Um, and I think every freelance performer is in the same boat. Right. Uh, you can only say no so many times. And uh, you always want to be appreciated and asked to do things. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's that juggling act. Uh, and so once we get out of COVID, it's, you know, in in this kind of rest area that we've been in for a while, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how things move forward uh, mm -hmm. from that point. 
fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about how you even build your um your career up to get to this point to get you where you are now. You know, because every there are a lot of musicians out there that you know want to be where you are as or want to be playing for a major symphony orchestra or even a town or a sim mm. or a city orchestra. You know, so how. Mm. how does how do you go about the process of even auditioning for a group like this because you said you said to quote you you say you're a freelance musician but you do get calls right how do you even get calls to begin with like well what are the things a young musician needs to be doing in order to put themselves out there i mean i know you 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 as a professor you probably teach this over and over and over but for someone out there who's just you know just trying to get their start like what would you recommend and like what what are the steps that people normally take to get to you know this position for you yeah well i mean i would imagine as a journalist there are a lot of similarities uh you know because one of the most important things is to start making contacts you know mm -hmm. so as you start to build your base of contacts um you start to get more calls and, uh, and, you know, specifically for a musician, um, there, you know, somebody who's, for instance, just come right out of college, who's mm -hmm. got a degree in performance or whatever, um, then they have to just start making contact. So anytime somebody asks them to play, you need to play because that's a way of kind of building your, your contact base. Um, and... You know, for instance, I, I think of myself here in Indianapolis because I moved here in 1998, mm -hmm. and and my you know I moved here primarily because I was uh, I started teaching at Indiana State. So Indiana State is in Terre Haute, um, so all of my work focus was in that area. It took uh, it took a while to start building up uh, the contacts here in Indianapolis. Uh, that kind of led me to being able to play with okay. the symphony. Uh, in fact, it took 10 years of my being here before I was called to play with the symphony. Um, so it was, it was a long time. I mean, I had a full-time job going and everything, but it did take a long time to kind of break into right. that, uh, into that, uh, playing with that group. And fortunately, uh, you know, for a long time, when I had first started here, they didn't have too many auditions for uh, for subs, mm -hmm. uh, but then they started to have more auditions for subs, and so I ended up taking a couple of those auditions, and that helped to get me into into the loop. So you know, you've got to make your contacts. You have to you know just be auditioning for just about everything um, uh, that comes your way, and then at the same time, you've got to somehow make a living uh, while you're <laughs> while you're trying to do all of that. You know. Um, but honestly, it's the context and, and just playing for people and auditioning uh, that starts to move the things forward. Right. So at the time, because this, this method that you're talking about, this, um, the concept of making connections has drastically changed. 98, you know, since 98, you know, mm -hmm. 22, 23, we're coming up on 23 years now. Like um, the way in which you make and network yeah. contacts, how has that evolved for you? And what would you say is the biggest difference to now uh compared to when you were starting to make connections at that point in time uh wow that's a that's a really good question um, if anything comes to mind i know I the, the basics still apply you know you have to be willing to put yourself out there but you know with the advent of technology with youtube right. music making the, the whole music scene of the world you can watch someone in brooklyn from Brooklyn to Thailand, you can watch anybody <laughs> make anything at any point in time. So in by effect, the competition pool has just increased dramatically. How do you like now put yourself out there? Like and still and, and the age old question, still manage to make a living at the same time. <laughs> you know? Well, as you know, as I said, I mean, fortunately I have a full time gig. And um, and I'm not in jeopardy of losing that just because I don't I'm not performing on YouTube or anything. So that's helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say that my for me the difference is that you know when I first got here, really wanted to to move, mm -hmm. um, make contacts 
pretty quickly. You know, I really, I really wanted to develop that. Now it's it's a little bit different. It's it's not that I'm not interested in uh, in developing that side of of my career, mm-hmm. but I'm at a different point in my career, right. and uh, and so if I'm so if I'm not, you know, I don't know. The whole idea of auditioning anymore to me is just not so much fun because yeah, I've spent course. years and years and years and years you, you, doing that. Yeah. You just have so much. You have to. You have so much on top of that that you need to. So the audition had better be like something crazy and like it. For I, I gather at this point in your career and like an audition. Not only is it the audition, you have to take time to learn the material. Then you have to get right. to the audition process for you. Like so, but do auditions still come your way though? Do do at this point in your career, are you still getting like, ha, like for example, has the symphony ever reached out to you say, hey, like we're thinking about, or we're not we're not thinking about like, hey, have they ever offered you like a full time gig? Um, and have you ever kind of weighed that decision uh, before? That's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, an audition is not something that is. Uh, well, okay, except for in some rare cases, right. an audition is just something that you can do. So um, it's it's not like it's an invitation. Gotcha. So I mean, uh, our our moments like that. So for instance, uh, I would expect that a concert master position for the Indianapolis Symphony, for the Chicago Symphony, for you know some of the big orchestras, mm-hmm. those are more by invitation. Um, whereas most of the regular section playing is just, it's an open call Mm -hmm. for an audition. And so, yeah, I mean, so, you know, I get the, uh, the musicians union paper every month and it lists all of the different auditions that are happening around the country. Oh, okay. And, um, and so if I look at one and I say, oh, would be a good audition to take. I mean, that would be an interesting orchestra to play with. Then, if I if if I really want to, then I would get myself ready. I download the audition list of repertoire that I would need to uh, perform, and I would just take that audition. Um, I kind of stopped doing that a few years ago, <laughs> you know, because as I said, you know, it's after doing that for years and years and years, it's just like okay, I really have the energy to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm at a point where I'm, I'm just not so interested in doing that, but that is the way that, uh, that you would get that kind of a job. So if you wanted a full-time job in an orchestra or it doesn't even have to be a full-time job, uh, even a part-time jobs are advertised that way. And so they provide you with a list of repertoire that you need to perform on that audition. Mm-hmm. And then, then you go audition, but you know, for like a, for instance, once I did audition for the Chicago symphony or something like 200 cellists auditioning for the same wow. position. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, it's an incredibly daunting Mm-hmm. You know, thing to do. Wow. Um, but it's a it's a real learning experience, that's for sure. You know, this is why I always encourage people, um, whenever the conversation comes to music specifically, like I always recommend, hey, if you live in a major city or a city in general, you should check out your sim- your city symphony orchestra. Because the oh, yeah. level of artistry, the level of craft on display at all of these concerts, it's like that you cannot even begin to imagine the collected amount of time that these people have put in to their craft, <laughs> to their music. That is like, true. I, you know, I, my first experience with the Indiana Symphony Orchestra was uh, me and my friends. Um, you know, many orchestras have this, many symphony orchestras have this, where students uh, get discounted tickets. So at the time I was going to Taylor University. Oh, yeah, right. And me and a friend of mine, you know, I played in the sure. jazz band. I played in wind ensemble at the time as a drummer. Uh, we said, hey, I think they're playing uh, Scherzog and they're also playing... And they're flying Philip Quint in for the Cachaturian Violin oh, cool. Concerto. Yeah, I don't know if you were performing in that one, but yeah, and then, you know, Urbanski was, uh, uh, Christoph Urbanski, Urbanski, is that your oh, great. conductor? Yeah. So at the time, I think That's he right. was still new, and so we went down to see, and wow, it just, for me, oh, cool. that wasn't my first experience with the, with, uh, you know, a live symphony orchestra, but I can see that for anybody not versed in music at all, just to see that. Live, there's such a difference, you know. If people, you know, not to go on on too much of a tangent here, but people really don't know how hard it is to make music 
sound like that and by that i mean the recording you know because we take it for granted all the time yeah. i work at a grocery store currently uh and throughout christmas there were recordings mm. of um i don't know sugar plum fairy from tchaikovsky and huh? people take that for granted the way it sounds like it sounds good but you know it's such a bypassing product but for whatever reason when you set aside time to go watch it live you know to see either the nutcracker live and to have the accompaniment with you know the ballet oh, yeah. it's just is just an incredibly right. moving experience and the reason i ask about auditions is because this is such a level this is a world class level of music that we're talking about here the auditions mm. and what it must take to get to this point it it must be incredibly like you said daunting but at the same time if you do have the artistry it is i'd imagine it's some of the more exciting times you know especially when the when you know the specifics of how the hall starts to fill up before the thing and you see the musicians kind of tuning their instruments all that like is it's a it's an experience yeah. that hopefully we can return to you know and i and i want to take this opportunity now right. we the music consuming community and hobbyists we thank you <laughs> we sincerely yeah. thank you for your work man it is it's incredible to go to one of these um to any one of these performances i do have a question though um for several questions about the the ins and outs of being a celloist and violinist a string player in your opinion mm -hmm. um so one of the burning questions i had from uh from a certain family member of mine that really loves music is uh he <laughs> can you tell uh by the sound when you are listening when the the maker of the violin you know because certain violinists they have you know old makers like Stradivarius or um oh yeah Gwyn right. Gwynevarius uh do you um Gwynevari yeah, yeah. Gwynevari can you tell when it's a Stradivarius or for yourself I know that's a very I out know. of the limb nerdy question no. but that that was just a I remembered uh all of a sudden that was a question that one of, one of my relatives wanted me to ask you personally uh like because i know you probably perform um, so many people who have like this these incredible music uh instruments uh, yeah right um and i think it would be really hard uh, well i mean there may be some people who can actually mm -hmm. uh i would not be surprised that there are some people who could maybe tell the difference between a strad and a guinary uh, but that is a very small fraction of people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I think more likely you're going to be able to tell the difference between an instrument that is really old, like right. a Strad, mm -hmm. uh, versus something that is new. Because uh, there's just a difference in the, in the timbre uh, of the instruments. Um, but even then, I mean, today's makers are are phenomenal and uh and i know some really great players who are playing on uh, relatively new instruments mm -hmm. and making them sound like like the great great old instruments so it's it's hard to say i mean i think um i'll put another spin on it I, there are you can definitely tell the difference between performers so for instance i can hear a uh, performance of Yo-Yo Ma next to Yano Starker, mm -hmm. and I could tell you which which is which very easily because of the playing style. Right. Now, um, whether or not they're playing, you know, what instruments they're playing, no, there's no way I'd be able to tell yeah. you that. Um, so that's, a, that's, I mean, boy, it, it's... Every I know it's a very kind of in the weeds. So different. Right. <laughs> It's a very in the <laughs> weeds kind really of nerdy weeds, topic, but I love it. You know, I love stuff it's an like interesting, this. It's an interesting question. Um, but I think because every single instrument, regardless of its age, has a different character. Right. Um, and that's why as, as a string player, if you're going to buy a new instrument, you've got to be, I mean, talk about auditioning for orchestras. You also have to audition the instrument that you're going to be playing because oh. it is part of your character. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody plays with a different style and every instrument has a different character in itself because the wood is different depending on the age, the way it's been made. Every element of an instrument makes it unique. And so therefore it's really hard um, to to tell the difference between necessarily a really old instrument and a really new instrument sometimes mm -hmm. right and as a musician yeah. you're like as a musician you're it's almost 
it pretty much is an investment on on your part, right? Just to try to yeah. like this, because whatever you put out there, when when you go auditioning, I've never heard anybody say that before. The fact that when you audition, you're also auditioning the instrument, because I, I've never heard because uh, at least um, outside the classical realm, you know, as a drummer, I do know several drummers that are in this industry, and they, you know, they invest in ride mm-hmm. cymbals, they invest in a certain kind of hi hat or pedal, whatever yeah. it takes to get for them to make that sound and you know i would gather when you were first uh starting to you know put kind of piece your career together was this did you take risks at all and say you know i'm gonna spend i'm gonna spend this amount of money to get this so that i can get this kind of sound and then just roll with it like there was that other part too where like, you probably there was probably a huge gray area at the time for you and like how to achieve the sound you wanted per se yeah Right, of course. Right, exactly. I mean, because it is it is definitely an investment, and you have to uh, you have to have an instrument that is of professional quality. Which you know, I mean, the instruments cost a lot. I mean, string instruments, uh, especially, uh, are well known for being <laughs> extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so to get a professional instrument, you know, when it's going to sound professional. You know, you're talking at least twenty thousand right. dollars for for a good instrument, and that's that's kind of the bottom of right. yeah. of uh, of where you need to be. I would say most players are playing on instruments anywhere between, you know, maybe thirty and a hundred thousand um, dollars, and that's that's a pretty wide range. And I mean, there aren't that many musicians who make that kind of money. You know, so yeah. so it is a huge investment. Um, and, but, you know, I do know people who will take auditions and borrow instruments for mm-hmm. those auditions okay. because they know, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, an irrefutable uh, fact that the quality of the instrument makes a difference in an audition situation. Right. Uh, and, and oftentimes the orchestra will then ask you know, if they like your playing, they will ask, is that your instrument? Or, you know, will you be playing that uh, with the orchestra? Wow. Okay, um, that's, that, I did not know that at all. That's, that's, yeah. that's pretty detailed kind of analysis. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it's, it is a reality because people mm-hmm. will borrow instruments to do that. Um, and uh, with, for good reason, you know, there's good reason to do that. But uh, the orchestra also wants to know that that's the quality of sound that they're going to be getting when they hire you. So Mm -hmm. how often is that the case, though? Because the first time I was ever exposed to this kind of subject, this niche subject amongst strings players, you know, especially the upper echelon as yourself, uh, was I read this article back in the day. uh, It was this article put out by The Washington Post. You've probably read it. It's called Pearls Before Breakfast. And it talks about Joshua Bell's, uh, if you know Joshua Bell, the, you know, of course, yeah, uh, the, you know, very popular American recitalist and one of the best musicians in the world honestly he mm. there was this whole article there's this whole section in the article talking about how bizarre it was to have someone playing a Stradivarius in the subway and not just any Stradivarius yes. the golden <laughs> Stradivarius that has a whole kind of history behind it as well like um and that just kind of yeah. turned me on to the idea of you know you know the instrument you play and especially strings like the, the way down to the creakiness and how much resin you put in in the bowl or whatnot to me it's it's a really huh? really interesting subject and and it just goes more into the appreciation of what's going on just the artic- medicated just the articulate detail that happens when 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 a performance happens you know yeah, yeah. right yeah that well i mean that whole thing with him performing in the subways uh was pretty phenomenal <laughs> Um, and yeah, I mean, the fact that I assume he was playing his Strad, I, I don't know exactly what he was playing. I assume yeah. he was, um, but yeah, that was, that was a pretty amazing thing. And his, you know, he has such a beautiful instrument as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, that Wait, was, that was, <laughs> he is from Indiana. Have you, like, have you ever gotten course, a chance yeah. to play, to play with him as far as, you know, in you being in the new orchestra as he plays feature wise, you, yeah, you probably had I've the played, chance to work I've, with him several times, huh? I've played with him at least mm, two or three times. Uh, mm-hmm. I, uh, I played with him a couple of times with the Indianapolis Symphony. And also he came and performed in a music festival that I've been a part of, of uh, out in Bellingham, Washington. Okay. Uh, he was there a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just wow, what an 
incredible uh, artist he is. Um, yeah. One of the he's, main he's a lot of fun to work with. One of the main criticisms with him amongst, you know, a very small community is that he is a very flamboyant player. Like I I got to see him play um uh this was again with the Indiana Symphony Orchestra, but I had the really good chance. Again, this was when I was a student. I was going to milk every last drop of that student discount <laughs> that you can imagine. Correct. I, oh man, because ten dollars and I can sit in the third row and I can see Joshua Bell play um Brock's uh, Scottish fantasy. Are you kidding me? Yes, I'm going to do it. So I went and when I did, what I immediately right. noticed was just how, I mean, I've seen videos of him play, but certain violinists, you know, they're very stoic, but this guy, he's just, he's almost like he's, he's a gymnast. He's kind of arcing way back and he's just, yeah. but if you close your eyes, you don't see that at all. So I, I guess that bothers <laughs> some people. It certainly didn't bother me at all. Uh-huh. Um, but he did, of course. Go yeah, I, to, I think that's. Yeah. You think that's what? I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was curious. He to hear did, of course, say. go to um, IU, which is your, I, I don't mm-hmm. know how you guys feel <laughs> about between schools or whatnot. IU, ISU, Butler, yeah. uh, all these top schools. And then you have my little baby school, Taylor, just off to the side. Um, <laughs> the music scene in Indiana is one that's pretty fascinating because Indiana's home to you said you see you said yourself you teach uh, the history of rock and roll or you know your music history Mm -hmm. Indiana is a hotbed of some really interesting music scenes because you have anywhere from ISU to IU where you guys have some pretty good Mm -hmm. music uh, programs you know IU you know Chris Bodie uh, Joshua Bell Mm -hmm. just to name two musicians that I vaguely know coming out of there like some interesting music scene going on and then in the state of Indiana as a whole like I mean, Michael Jackson was from here. <laughs> James Dean. Um, <laughs> That's true. Correct. Yeah. I have visited James Dean's uh, uh, grave in uh, uh, Marion, right? In, or in Indiana? Yeah. Yeah, it's in. Uh, where's it? The where's the little town? It's like Black Fair, Florida. Fair something. Oh, Fairmount. Uh, Fairmount. Now. It's a Fairmount. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. I mean, you are exactly right. I mean. Indiana has an amazing amount of musical activity going on. And IU is one of the top music schools in the country, mm-hmm. uh, if not the world. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of the largest. I think it may be the largest um, uh, music school in the country. Is it really? How, what what, yeah. what makes you say that as far as like cl- classifying what, I mean, how big it's, a music program can be? Why do you say meaning that? Meaning the number of students. Oh, I mean, okay, it's, it's, okay. It's uh, it's one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest, in the country. Mm-hmm. So it's it has been a hotbed of musical activity for for decades now. And Joshua Bell studied with one of the great violin teachers, Joseph uh, Gingold, Gingold, who was there. And um, and so and one of the great cello teachers, Janov Starker, uh, was there until he died a, f- a few years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, just a lot of incredible activity going on there. ISU, I mean, ISU is a totally different kind of school. I mean, we're more um, geared towards music education for people who want to teach in public schools and so forth like that. IU is more geared towards the high level performers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so we're, I've, you know, we're very different institutions in that regard. Um, back to your thought about the way Joshua Bell performs. <laughs> I know it's a niche it, topic, it's, but yeah, yeah. I, I know it is it is a thing amongst people who listen to classical music. It's like, well, this guy's very <laughs> he's very acrobatic. Well, the, you know, it's a, it's an interesting topic because um if you went to see a rock and roll band, you right. would not expect them to just stand stoically no. in front of their mic, right? No. Um, and, and it's not to say that anybody in classical music is trying to emulate rock and roll in that sense, but I do think mm-hmm. that there is a little bit of cross-pollinization there mm-hmm. that, that um, in, you know, because as classical musicians, we also want to entertain the public. We also want them to be engaged in a very similar kind of way with this different kind of music. And to present that music just being very stoic about it is not always the most engaging for the audience. So it's it's kind of a fine line because 
you know, as an audience member, you may want to come to a classical music concert because yeah. you don't like all of the moving around. And so that might, uh, you know, bother you. But for other people, it's, it's an engaging way of expressing this, uh, the music that the person is performing. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a tricky topic. And I, I do think that there are classical musicians who take it too far. Um, but it is kind of a personal expression. And, um, so, yeah, I do think that that popular music has contributed to that, because I think if you look back at the performances, you know, in 1950 and before, uh, it would have been really rare to find anything like that. Yeah. As far as movement as uh, playing your playing your instrument, I've just. I, there's this perception that classical music has to be stoic, but in my experience, seeing I with, with classical music, I mainly follow uh, pianists and uh, violinists. You know, going all the way back to like either Nathan Milstein or you know these old names, Joshua mm -hmm. Heifetz, uh, Hi Heifetz, or you know that huh? um, these guys, they still do move their bodies. You know, and I can even recall an experience where you know I got to go see. I'm very lucky, uh, Kurt. I, I'm very lucky to have somehow been able to finagle my way and talk a bunch of friends into going to see concerts. Uh, I I got to go see. We got to go see at the end of this. Uh, at the end of this internship I had out in Chicago, we got to go see Itzhak Perlman perform with the CSO at the Ravinia. At oh. the yeah, oh. I mean, talk about oh. the the who, like whatever, right? Um, you know, I you know Itzhak. That's the only concert really that I think I've ever cried at, just because he played. A bunch of the popular movie music, which I didn't expect them to play. But what I also like noticed Schindler's was, List. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Schindler's List. Oh, you named it. Uh, Schindler's List. Right. Uh, Cinema Paradiso. Just all the. And to be honest, I think the orchestra was having a blast because if all things considered, it might be some of the easier stuff they played that night. They just got done playing. Um, <laughs> I think it was either Stravinsky or some other more complicated orchestra. And so for oh, them yeah. to switch into this kind of quote unquote easier <laughs> movie based music that, that right. <laughs> which they probably heard a million times over. Um, but one of the yeah. things I did also notice was just the sheer movement, which is why I keep urging people to go see these concerts is because it's not just it's it's not just the sound, you know. Yes, the sound is, you know, this airwave. There's a whole science behind mm. it, but just. I remember very vividly uh, seeing Robert Chen, the, he, I think he's currently still the concert mm. master of uh, Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He was bouncing off the huh? chair. Right. He, he was, <laughs> and he wasn't alone. It was just a <laughs> bunch of these kind of different crazy musicians just right. bouncing off the, bouncing off the chair almost so passionately. Do, do you find yourself doing that often? And do you, uh, is that very commonplace with uh, the symphony you play at and do you find it commonplace with the students that you uh, tutor as well do you how how do you go I, this is a multi-layered question by the way do you see it it is a multi-layered question and yeah. do you encourage it amongst your students and anybody just playing uh instrument yes yes the answer to that question yes i definitely <laughs> encourage it um within reason um and a lot of that is because, and and I'll say that most of my students, I'll start from that vantage point uh, first, most of my students do not move at all. And, mm. uh, and the goal is to try to get them to move. And part of that is because, believe it or not, there's a lot of tension in, in your playing that is released when you start to move a little bit, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you're you know, just imagine you're up talking in front of a group of people or something, right? If you're just like locked in uh, and you don't move at all, there's a lot of tension in your body. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, so if you can kind of get yourself to move a little bit, then you can release some of that tension. And so a lot of students develop this just this sense of tension mm -hmm. in their playing because they're just not moving. They're, you know, it's just it's totally unnatural to just play like stoic. Um, so, yes, my goal is to get them to move now the goal of that is to get them to move a little bit more fluidly so that they can release some of the tension in their body. It's not to play like Joshua Bell, you know, so I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to get them to that point, but I'm trying to re release that tension. Mm -hmm. And so in my own playing, yes, I move uh, quite a bit again, not, not to that extreme. Um, and it, it, you know, I do know that some performers have had 
you know, some physical difficulties because yeah. of the amount of movement. In fact, I know that Yo-Yo Ma had back surgery, um, and so he has had to, you know, constrain a little bit his his movement. But um, but I think again, it's just it's a means of expression, and it also depends to some extent what you are playing. Right. So, for instance, if you are playing in an orchestra. You know, most, a lot of orchestra musicians tend to be a little bit more, less, you know, use a little bit less motion. And that is right. because most of the motion in an orchestra is coming from the conductor. Mm -hmm. You know, the conductor mm -hmm. is keeping everybody together. And, you know, you, if you've seen Krzysztof Urbanski, um, you know, conduct, you know the amount of motion that he that yes. he uses in in the performance, and it's 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 almost like ballet in some ways the way right. that he uses his gestures, um, and that is what helps to keep everybody together. If you think for a moment back to the idea of a string quartet, you don't have a court, you don't have a conductor. The only way to really communicate, you know, certain language, right? things is the body language, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're always kind of cueing using body language, and which is hard to do if you're just staying still completely all the time. Um, so, there is a certain amount of that motion that is necessary for communication, and I would say that you know Joshua Bell to some extent is using his motion for communication as well. Um, he's communicating to the conductor, this is where the beat is, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also, again, communicating the emotion of the piece uh, to the audience. So it's, there are multiple reasons for, for that motion. Mm -hmm. And again, it's kind of dependent on the context. Right. So you said yourself, you teach, um, you said one of your favorite classes to teach is rock, uh, history of rock and roll. Mm. Uh, why is that? And you know, in some you you kind of touched on it a little bit, kind of the um, melding of universes, how one kind of informs the other. Uh, mm. You know, moving. You don't have to tell rock and roll musicians, or you know, you do not have to tell a drummer to uh, to communicate his body language, because a lot of. And <laughs> I, I think the thing I'm trying to get at here is uh, the difference in how uh, certain instruments slash musicians are raised and kind of how they come to to their own identity right because as a drummer you're kind of semi-conducting the band from for me ah, i'm kind of ah, absolutely i i can't tell you how easy the click track has made my life because the modern kind of thing of the click is just ah. well everyone's here listening to it i don't have to look at so yeah. many different people anymore but um for string right. instruments and you know in, in possibly in the more classic repertoire where have you seen kind of the melding of universes for you like wh what are some things you got you actively take from either rock and roll and you put into classical music or taking from classical music and putting it into rock or, or contemporary uh, secular music or whatever wow that's a that's a big question I know. <laughs> and i could go on for a while for that <laughs> um so Okay, and so in so many different ways, I think right, the obviously. two are mix. And uh, and I like your analogy of the drummer, uh, you know, kind of controlling things, because I think in many ways the drummer definitely does kind of control things. So I think, you know, I, th you know, I teach about the Beatles, of course, and mm -hmm. one of the things that really floors me every time I come back to teaching the Beatles is I think about those, uh, the performances that they did where and you think about the technology at that time right where they they only had the house pa system to work with you know they had a couple of mics in the house pa system they can't hear themselves at all right you know because they've got mobs and mobs of girls just oh, screaming yeah. at the concert Especially when they, came to the they can't hear yeah. us Right. You can't hear a single thing that they're performing, which is yeah. why they quit performing in 1966, because mm -hmm. they just couldn't hear themselves. It was no fun musically anymore. And so the only way for them to stay together was Ringo Starr back there just hammering out the beats. And, uh, and so the drummer literally kept them together because that mm -hmm. was the only way they knew where they were. Um, and so, and, and, and he kind of took his cue visually from what the guys were doing in front right. of him, you yeah. know, cause he's got three guys in front of him. And so he can kind of just kind of judge from what they're doing. He can kind of keep the beat. Uh, I'm completely fascinating and how that, 
how difficult it must have been to perform in that situation for them. Because, you know, I've certainly been in plenty of uh, situations myself, uh, you know, I'll give one example. There's, uh, and talk about a composer who kind of integrates the idea of popular and classical music. A couple of composers would be uh, Philip Glass and Steve oh, Reich. Oh, Philip Glass. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Right. So both really phenomenal composers. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and so I've played a few pieces by Steve Reich. Okay. Uh, and he is kind of like Philip Glass. They tend towards kind of minimalism, where they have an idea that's rep repeated over and over in this in this kind of very layered way. Um, one of the pieces that I performed is called Different Trains. It's a three movement piece. It's about three, 30 minutes long. It's for string quartet. Uh, mm -hmm. But the quartet is amplified and there's also a, uh, an audio track that goes mm -hmm. along with it that you have to be together with. And, uh, and so the way to play with that audio track is you have monitors on the stage um, with you. And then, of course, you have the house speakers that are going out to the audience. Well, you know, depending on how those um, monitors are placed, sometimes you can hear what's going on and sometimes you can't. And I remember one performance in, uh, specifically where we had kind of set up and we had rehearsed and everything. But when we got to the performance and there was an audience in the hall, kind of soaked up some of the sound and it was just totally different. Right. Uh, and so it's really hard to kind of stay with the beat. Um, and, uh, and so I, I realized how important being able to hear is. And in that case, you know, you kind of, um, you're dependent on what you're hearing, just like you would be for a click track. And mm -hmm. I've done plenty of recording uh, at, there's a, studio here in Indianapolis called Airborne. Uh, they do a lot of recording. Um, and so I've done quite a bit of work there. Um, you know, some of the things that I've done are just, you know, simple things like uh, Disney on ice types of tracks. Wow. And it's all done with with click track. You know? So we're all wearing these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've got a conductor, but you also are wearing a headphone. You've got this click track. And mm -hmm. so that helps, of course, to, to keep everybody together. But, you know, the click track didn't come along until, what, 1980s or so. Yeah, so you just think about all of this, all of this music prior to that, that, you know, it was just the drummer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, yeah. or whatever. I mean, just kind of keeping everything together. Yeah. Um, I, I, in fact, I have a, I have a friend who um, teaches up at University of British Columbia in uh, um, okay. in Vancouver okay. and he's actually writing a book about the click track and oh I'm so, I am so fascinated please keep me in the uh, loop for this like he's writing a book about this like just how it's affected yeah, I mean, music he, the industry and kind of yeah right oh, that's so exactly cool. I mean, it's such an interesting topic in itself and uh, you know because it's it's a it's an important tool for recording artists to really keep everybody together right. and so for instance even in our playing at Castleton uh, at the church I mean it's that click track that really helps to keep everybody together um, yet at the same time you lose a certain amount of communication between mm -hmm. musicians yeah. uh, because of that right you know because you're relying on this kind of electronic thing and you're not really zoned in on e on, on each other as you're playing mm -hmm. what are your true feelings about that honestly like well because i know it's it's helped you it's helped us as musicians a lot right but uh when did mm. you start to notice it, you said it became a thing in the 80s but you know, most musicians growing up or, um, you know, performing or playing, you know, before your professional career or even, you know, in high school, and whatnot, as you're coming up, you're not really performing to a click. But a lot of these kids now oh, growing right. up, they're playing, they're performing, they're actively being encouraged to perform mm. with the click. You know, if, uh, you know, at the church I play at, hey, if, if we get some younger drummers, we're going to have to teach them uh, or it takes some getting used to, you know, but yeah. you... And me, I guess I'm probably the last maybe generation to go through it without uh, having a whole lot of um, that growing up. I feel like the body language aspect. Um, do, do you think it's it? Do you think it's possible to still achieve that kind of synergies, synergy and, you know, the body language thing with the click at the same time? Or do you find you focus on one thing over the other? Do you prior 
in in those kind of situations, what do you prioritize uh, for your preference? That's a great question um, because I don't know that there is a firm answer on that. Um, I mean, I think the, um, you know if I think to to the Castleton Church and the way that the stage is set up. It would be really hard to perform in there without the click mm -hmm. because of the distance between everybody, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and in in so many churches now, the drummer is behind uh, this wall <laughs> of plastic. He's in his enclosure, right? basically. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's totally, totally enclosed. And so <laughs> how can you possibly be part of yeah. the ensemble when you're totally enclosed like that? Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating tool. I think, I mean, my personal feeling is that it's just overused. Mm. It would be nice to be able to do stuff without it. Yeah. Um, but I also understand why it's used. And, mm. um, and I guess basically what it allows is for a performance to be together much more quickly than it could be if you didn't right you know so for instance you know in preparing for a church service without it it would take a lot more rehearsal you yeah. know i mean the the group oh, yeah. would have to be yeah. together a lot more um and so it really helps to cut down on the amount of time that is used in pre preparation for that performance mm -hmm. uh, or or for the church service um so uh, I think it can be used effectively, and um, but I also think that it would be nice to sometimes work without it. <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> you know because I it, up, it just yeah, allows exactly. a different kind of communication. Yeah, I grew up playing without. I mean, in a jazz band, especially with something with music that's so dynamic mm. and uh, where you really forced to listen to other people. That's the joy of it. Also, is that you really get to it without the click so much. You know, because I played in jazz bands. I played for. Um, you know pentecostal gospel churches it's there's an energy there that mm. doesn't that maybe kind of gets siphoned out a little bit with the click but it is an essential skill um and it's you, you as a professor you obviously have to you probably do uh encourage it to some extent but when someone uh, this is kind of a segue in, into a question i really want to mm. ask you um what are your yeah. feelings whenever you hear someone wants to learn an instrument and their first gut instinct is to get lessons for it like are you kind of mm -hmm. are you in the camp of oh you know lessons are essential and they obviously are but there's this whenever and me i'm at the very bottom of this totem pole right because you're, you're teaching music at the highest of levels but me <laughs> i've been approached several times to teach drums you know and it's for me i've always mm -hmm. kind of said well in order for me to do that successfully i'm gonna i have to at least know that the student wants to learn it that the student uh yeah. has a passion for the music because if in, in my theory if if the kid or not even a kid if the person loves the music they're gonna find a way to recreate what's in their head you know mm -hmm. but uh, i feel me coming from and i don't want to stereotype my culture too much but i i, I come from a culture where <laughs> everything is very education oriented or if you want to do something you have to go learn it but i Having been exposed to how, you know, the African-American community experiences music, they just, they learn by repetition. They encourage the youngsters to go up there and watch uh, the musicians play up closely. And then, you know, hey, hop on, <laughs> you know. Uh, what are your feelings on the modern day, um, modern day scene of learning music? Uh, I know that's a very, very broad question. But I think you know what I'm getting at there. Yeah, it is. It is a broad question, uh, question, and I and I totally see your point in that. Uh, and I'll go back to the beginning of rock and roll history. I mean, the way that a lot of uh, rock and roll musicians learn is just by watching and listening uh, to the people that they like, right? Yeah. You know, so you know, the, the British guys like the the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, the way that they learned to play music was by listening to all of the rhythm and blues artists here in America, you know, mm -hmm. from the fifties. Um, so they did not get 
well, most of them didn't get teachers uh, to learn how to technically play their instruments really well. Mm -hmm. uh, they just learned it. And so I think there is definitely something to be said for that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, as a classical cellist, you know, I have to ask myself, okay, um, what is a classical cellist going to be doing uh, if with their career? I mean, if they really want to pursue it as a career, then they're going to waste a whole lot of time learning bad habits that could be avoided early on if you would take lessons. Yeah. Um, and so I think it can go both ways. You know, if, if a classical cellist is going to be um, required to do certain types of things, and, uh, and while you can teach yourself certain things uh, on the cello by just watching videos and so forth, uh, taking the lessons will make the process so much easier, easier and, right? yeah. and um, you will just not learn a bunch of bad habits that you will eventually have to get over and get right. rid of. Um, so you'll end up spending so much time just practicing out these bad habits um, that I don't know that it's, it's totally worth it. So I mean, in my experience, the students that I've had who have come to me who have been self-taught um, really struggle with learning things quickly um, mm -hmm. because they're just having to break so many so many habits yeah uh, so uh, and uh, i would i imagine that's true in with any instrument mm -hmm. um but, but again it's not to say that they can't learn on their own it's just uh it's just a different kind of process yeah. and most most classical musicians are not going to be getting really great orchestra jobs learning right. by themselves exactly you know? yeah. it's just not going to happen yeah it's such a different world but the reason i ask is because today we're living i mean it's an age-old saying at this point but we're living in an age where you can, <laughs> i mean skillshare so so many different online kind of things where hey you have the instrument like we've seen we're starting to see the fruits of uh the internet's <laughs> labor per, per se mm. you know we're starting to see kind of online yeah. learning um really take off i, I don't know if the, you know this youtube creator at all but yeah. adam neely on youtube is just this wonderful music educator and tons of different music educators and you you're probably mm. turning into one as well you mean you, your your daily your day-to-day -day repertoire is online learning at the moment it probably this whole covid um 19 experience has as unpleasant as it has been <laughs> for a lot of people it probably has opened up several careers that didn't exist before. Um, uh, even in music, right. it's, it's opened up some possibilities that maybe didn't mm. exist before. And, and the, the idea of lessons has always kind of bothered me because yes, you do need it to not form dirty habits. For example, me, um, yeah. double strokes were horrible yeah. my first five years because I, <laughs> although I was not self-taught, you know, I, my, my drum teacher at the time was very busy you know, just learning, just trying to get gigs for himself. And I sort of self-taught yeah. strokes. And to this day, it's still a little bit of a hamper. I have to, oh, wait, not, that's not, if I want to do uh, it more effectively, you, you know, self-taught, there's kind of a hamper. But there's right. that little passion inkling that I feel kind of gets stamped out a lot with music. And um, the, yeah. the, the, a very popular bassist by the name of Victor Wooten, he will attest it, is like music Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. You probably heard his. He had a tech talk on how music is a language, and yeah. I so identify with that. But you know, I yeah. spent a good amount of time with classical musicians in college, and it's just, uh, it's been interesting to get to know, uh, like, how different camps approach music. Um, yeah. I, I guess as some one of my closing questions. Um, so you said you teach mm -hmm. uh, history of rock and roll. Can you go ahead and name? several records okay not even rock and roll specifically but if you had to name a few <laughs> records that you that you identify with or or that you would recommend people listen to just, just to kind of know hey who is kurt uh professor kurt fowler like who wh wh you you mentioned the beatles what are some records that you like say man oh like, man if you're, if you're teaching That's a, a good student, question come up to you hey pray professor like what do you listen to in your off time <laughs> you know <laughs> Man, I listen. I listen to all types of different stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know. And and my 
then the history of rock class is just going to open up a whole world of of fun stuff because you know once you start going learning a little bit about this artist and you realize oh man they were really influenced by this artist and like oh my gosh who's lead belly well lead belly was this incredible artist from you know yes. louisiana who uh you know was just had so much repertoire and um and so uh ah huh, a few albums that's a really good question well i have to say that um classical inclu oh, included by the way it doesn't just have to be rock and roll i see okay yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um wow well okay so okay or to to categorize a different thing okay so let's talk classical first then um you know so i think that every every classical musician has to be affected by Bach. There's no way to not be affected by that mm -hmm. incredible composer, you know, because, and for me, it's because his writing is so intellectual and intelligent, yet so passionate. You know, there's just so much in his music um, from 300 years ago that speaks and so if i'm going to sit down and play something totally by myself then it's going to be one of the bach cello suites because mm -hmm. it's just incredible music it's so peaceful yet emotional um i mean there's and and he has he wrote six suites for solo cello and mm -hmm. each one is very different each has a different character each has a different emotion and they're just incredible pieces to both play and to listen to um and so you know obviously bach would be one of the great composers that uh, that i would listen to but i also really love um uh, the music of beethoven because it's so g you know beethoven's yeah. music i mean he was the just so sound. on the edge yeah. yeah huge sound he was very and, rock and you roll know, <laughs> he was yeah. the rock and roll artist of yeah. you know the late 18th century and early 19th um it, it, you know there was something different around every corner you know it's so really loud here but really soft here and then just he brought so much more depth to the emotion of the music um but you know, one of the things I think that drew me to music as a whole, or classical music as a whole, and to the cello was the more romantic period of, mm -hmm. of music. So one of the, the pieces that drew me to the cello immediately was one of the sonatas by Brahms, because it, oh, used, yes. Yes. it used the low end of the cello in a way that I was like, oh my God gosh, this is why you would play the cello, you mm -hmm. know, because because of that low C this string. It's just an cello. incredible sound. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I fell in love with that sonata by Brahms. And then uh, then you can move forward and, and you can uh, I just love the music of Rachmaninoff because it's just so intensely romantic. Have you ever heard um, him play his stuff? Uh, Rachmaninoff himself? Yeah, Rachmaninoff. There's a record out there. You've probably yeah. heard it, but Rachmaninoff plays Rachmaninoff, mostly the piano, yes. I think. Right. This guy had fingers. Um, this guy had <laughs> giant <laughs> hands, and you can just exactly. hear it, you know. So Rachmaninoff, right. okay, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, you know, you mentioned the hands. I mean, mm -hmm. because I have, uh, you know, of course, I always play with pianists whenever I play the Rachmaninoff uh, Sonata. Yeah. And the Rachmaninoff Sonata for cello and piano has, of course, these huge oh, ranges in the piano where you just need these huge hands. And, and of course, a lot of the pianists that I play with are these, you know, small women. And how in the world they manage, you know, to do all of that is just incredible. Yeah. But, um, but I love Rachmaninoff. I love that the romantic period of music. But as I mentioned to you when we were talking on uh, Christmas Eve, sure. I also do a ton of new music mm -hmm. because I, I strongly believe in the composers that are living today. You know, yeah. Beethoven was was crazy in his day. We have a lot of composers who are, are pushing the edge of things today yeah. um, who and there are so many different styles. I mean, there's there's this really edgy kind of like way out there style cool, that, yeah. you know, most audiences go like, oh, my gosh, please tell it to stop <laughs> um, or 
uh, you've got composers who are integrating other popular styles mm -hmm. into classical music. Uh, you know, like we talked about with Philip Glass. I mean, um, uh, he started that trend uh, a long time ago. But there are a lot of composers today that are integrating interesting styles of music. And uh, for instance, uh, in the last few years, I've played music by a guy named Mark Mellitz, who is a composer okay. in Chicago. And um, uh, in his music, uh, has kind of that rhythmic energy that you find in popular music uh, with a classical, you know, the classical style. And I just love playing his music. In fact, I was practicing some of his stuff the other night. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said for, yeah, for yeah. contemporary music yeah. uh, and, and there's a different, there's a style out there for everyone. Um, so I, I do think that's fun in, in regards to other styles of music, you know, I listen to a ton of jazz because I love jazz. I think jazz is just an incredible, um, genre of music and has gone through so many interesting stages where it started off as dance music, but then became much more cerebral. Especially and, with Miles yeah, and like Dave. Ruben, exactly. Yeah, Miles yeah. Davis and so forth. You've got so much going on in the music mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it's just so interesting to listen to the various styles. And uh, and then with rock and roll, I mean, the, I, it's yeah. You know, I would say that I pretty much like any style in rock and roll, uh, and in the genres that I teach in my class, I, I, I mean, rap has never been one of my favorites, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there are some rap uh, groups that I have really learned to appreciate, oh, as, as such as teaching, uh, Run DMC. Run I mean, DMC. I just think, okay. Oh man, great stuff. And uh, and I also really like the Sugar Hill Gang because they were like oh, the very yeah, first. The OG, yeah. Of, yeah, of the very Hit the first. Hip, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah, cool. exactly. Right. Um, the Rapper's Delight, which is uh, which is a song that they sampled learned, the Apache you know? record and they just played on yeah. a loop and they, they went off. Yeah, that's <laughs> very, very fascinating stuff. So so I have learned to, to appreciate uh, that style. You know, a lot of the newer rap music um i like Kendrick less Moore. just just because at least some of the rap music i find just overwhelmingly negative you know yeah, and, and i tend to like positive stuff and in one of the groups that has been one of my favorite groups forever ever since i was a kid has been earth wind and fire oh um, yes <laughs> and one of the reasons that i like earth wind and fire is because maurice white the founder um really had in his idea of the group he wanted mm. to bring a positive message to the public yeah. and and that's what he did i mean he really that was his goal and he totally achieved it with with great 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 music yeah. um and and so yeah i mean that, those were some of the first records i ever owned as a kid were earth wind and earth, fire, wind and fire. wow you had a yeah. great childhood <laughs> you, <laughs> exactly. that's, a, that's a great upbringing right there that tells me a lot about you as a musician because well it's funny that you mentioned rap is uh, you know especially a lot of modern rap it makes sense because rap and hip-hop that is the music of i hate to say it but it's either fight or or pain music you know especially you uh, know if you ever if there's a rap song you should listen to i i would highly recommend um how much a dollar costs by kendrick lamar you may uh, have heard of it before i mean you've probably heard of kendrick lamar before he's very yes of course of right of course uh very he's a poet of you know, insane proportions but there's with a lot of great mm. rappers i i um for me i find there's there's this musical quality to the way they deliver you know so you mentioned sugar hill gang run dmc just the way their cadence and in the, in the way they uh, pronounce words it's just yes. that's a musical form in and of itself then i feel it, it's cool and it's refreshing to hear from you uh that you've taken on and you've kind of listened to these other genres not just typecast all, all classical music musicians you know <laughs> professors instructors but i have had a lot of stringent and you do need that you know because this is a music from the old world this is a music yeah form that's been around for 400 500 years long before we were here you know like you do need that structuralism but it's i i find it refreshing that um for someone who is so uh well versed in the classical universe to also be extremely passionate about the beatles 
or Led Zeppelin, you know, <laughs> Bonham just rocking, just, you know, trendset. Oh my gosh, he's numbers. great. He's amazing. Yeah. There's a lot of drummers who still, like to this day, I mean, Bonham is, he, is widely regarded across different sure. genres as one of the greatest drummers, you know. Um, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he, he was. And actually, I mean, it's interesting the way that they mic'd him in the group right. was yeah. really amazing as well his booming snare <laughs> so, um, exactly <laughs> yeah well kurt in in closing do you have any kind of advice again i know i we i asked this at the very beginning let um kind of, kind of coming to a close here do you have any advice for someone maybe not specifically starting a music career just you know because right now especially during covid it is a minefield to try to get into a career of your choosing. So, you know, it could be anywhere from me trying mm. to get into, you know, journalism or media or someone trying to be a musician. Um, what kind of kind of ha you being someone who's kind of walked the walk before, like, can, do you have any advice for people like me or people just trying to find a way at the moment? Just um, kind of any wow. kind of positive notes. That's really tough. Well, I mean, <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, I'll try to make this positive. It's okay. You um, you can be as real as you want. It's never going to care. <laughs> the uh I mean the reality is that nobody alive today has ever experienced anything like this. Yeah. So, um I I mean it's just so hard and um it's, it's hard to give people advice at this point except for the fact that we know that someday this will be over. This is, you know, this is not going to dictate our lives forever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so to me, at this point in time, you know, I've enjoyed learning new skills during this time. Uh, it, I've been forced to in ways that I never expected, um, but I've enjoyed that. And I, I think that it's, it's a great time to, to try to develop skills that may be handy sometime in the future. I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, I don't know if you ever had thoughts of doing a podcast before. I don't know if the COVID situation, you know, made you think more strongly about that. But, you know, stuff like this, right. you know, it just, it developed your skills in, in very different ways that who knows how that can be used in the future. Um, you know, people oftentimes lose their jobs and are forced to start thinking creatively and come up with something else. And oftentimes they find something that's even more satisfying than the, what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. um, so it, my advice is to use the time that you have to, you know, just learn new stuff. I, I mean, I just, for me as an educator, I just find learning fascinating. I don't care what it is. I just love learning about it. You know, I, you know, whether it be like learning how to video, uh, you know, broadcast our concerts or learning more about rock and roll. There's just always a way to, to develop yourself in ways that might surprise you in the future that you could use it. So, I find um, that encouraging. That's, that's about all I have that's to say awesome. in maybe a positive light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so. the, the, the tough part is honestly just the, for me, I, I would assume it's just goal setting. You know, a lot of people, yeah. you, you need to write what you want to do down. And uh, yeah, this podcast, although I'd wanted been, I had wanted to do it for a long time, COVID kind of kickstarted it. It's because the first, it was the first stretch of time that I'd said, yeah, all right. you said you wanted to do this for a year and a half. Now. You've never quote unquote had the time. Now you do have the time to so go mm -hmm. and do it. And right now I'm learning new things too. Like I've. I have to get the camera that you're using because it's HD and it looks a lot better than the you know, the crappy camera I'm using. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's me. Like you have the you, this is the first time I've been outranked in every technological category. Just talking someone through a podcast, but um, Kurt, thank you so much, man. Uh, very quickly, where can we find you? Um, ah. Some of your work and maybe feel free to plug yourself right here now, man. Like where can we kind of find your work online? If you've recorded anything and how can we? Um, <laughs> How can we support you, music, uh, your career even further? Well, I appreciate your asking. Um, it, there are, I mean, if you just kind of Google me, you'll find uh, mm -hmm. you'll find information 
about me. Um, but of course, as I said, my main thing is teaching at Indiana State University. So you mm-hmm. can look me up there at the uh, School of Music there at Indiana State. Um, I play in a couple of different ensembles. Uh, one ensemble that I play with is called the Here Ensemble, H-E-A-R-E. Uh, we put out uh, an album last year, just before COVID hit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's cello, flute, and piano. And it's actually all of the music is contemporary music. Um, and uh, it's, it was a fun album to put Here together. Here Orchestra, you said? Uh, Here Ensemble. Here so, Ensemble, okay. okay. Exactly. So the Here Ensemble. Um, so there's a website out there for that. I also have a little uh, saxophone and cello duo with a saxophone oh. colleague that teaches at Indiana State. Um, the bro fowler duo and so we've done we've commissioned a good number of pieces for the cello bro and saxophone fowler duo bro fowler duo that exactly. is an incredible name for, for a sax <laughs> cello combo i'm gonna check that out for sure that's awesome exactly and that is uh, again all contemporary classical music and as i said i mean we we have commissioned pieces for that ensemble because i mean when we started there were only just like one or two pieces for cello and saxophone and now there's this whole slew of of music for right. that uh that genre awesome. um but at any rate yeah so you can look up ensembles that i've performed in and uh, as you can probably just google me and find a few things uh, out there uh, but a lot of stuff i do is kind of just in the background oh i never music is never in the background for me which is why working <laughs> at a grocery store is kind of hard sometimes because <laughs> you hear certain right. tracks on a loop every day it's you know whatever yeah. um our name it's true well, Guys, this has been the Crunchy Take Podcast for this week. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you to Kurt Fowler for coming on. This has been an absolute privilege of mine. You can find these episodes on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Public, uh, Radio Public, and all streaming platforms of your choice. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.